Yeah, thanks everyone for coming. Now I want to talk tonight about the Square Kilometre Array and some of the fantastic science that it's going to do. Um, I've been aware of this project uh, right throughout my career, um, over 10 years, um, and when I was a, a PhD student, I remember seeing adverts at work um, for a meeting about this amazing new telescope that they wanted to build in 20 years' time, and I thought, ah, who cares, it's 20 years' time. But now, here we are, and the world has come together to design and build this amazing new telescope that will allow us to understand the universe in unprecedented ways. So that's what I want to talk to you about tonight. So when you look up in the night sky, you can see a lot of stars. And do you know how many stars you can see? you have a guess? Go on. About a trillion. Hmm, interesting. It's a good guess. In fact, what you can see with your naked eye is about 3,000 stars. But what we know, what we, what we guess as astronomers by compiling data, is that there are about 70 sextillion stars in the universe. And a 70 sextillion stars is about seven with 23 zeros after it. So there's a huge number of stars in the universe. Now, since 1610, we've actually had telescopes to show us a lot more than the 3,000 stars that we can see with our naked eye. So since then, since Galileo pointed the first telescope to the stars, to the planets up in the sky, we've just learned an amazing amount about the universe that we live in. And not only do we have optical telescopes, but we've built telescopes in different wavelengths of light. So the electromagnetic spectrum is, is the, the rainbow of colors, not just the colors that we can see, but the colors we can't see, from infrared, ultraviolet, optical, and also x-rays, gamma rays, radio waves, all those sorts of things. So tonight I'm going to talk about the radio sky and what we can learn from radio waves that come naturally from space. So if you imagine for a minute, can you imagine this? Imagine you're tuning your eyes to different colors. You see the world blue. Everything's blue. And then imagine tuning your eyes to red and everything looks different shades of red. Now if we tuned our eyes to longer wavelengths, much, much longer wavelengths, radio waves, these are waves that have a uh, length about this long. Now the sky would look like this. So this is the sky in radio waves. So if you could tune in your eyes to radio waves, this is what the sky would look like. So you can see thousands of little points of light. And those aren't, in fact, stars. These are galaxies, like the Milky Way that we live in. There are hundreds of thousands of millions of stars. And you can also see some big round objects as well. Some of those things are supernova remnants, so the gas that's come out of a huge star explosion in our galaxy. And some of those things are um, large areas of gas surrounding hot, massive stars in our galaxy that are belching out so much heat that they completely ionize their surroundings. That is, they break up the atoms around them because of the ultraviolet radiation that they pump out. So the sky looks very, very different in radio than it does in optical. So radio waves and radio telescopes allow astronomers to study the universe in very different eyes, different colors. So now I want us to tune our eyes to a different frequency again. Let's tune into Galaxy FM. And if you're an old fogey like me, you can remember, you can remember these old radios. Now, in the olden days, you didn't just press a button on an iPod to tune in a radio. It was actually one of these, these old-fashioned dials. So if we tune our, our eyes now into, into 21 centimeter wavelength light, that is radio waves, we see the universe as it is in hydrogen. Now this is the sky if you look at the hydrogen gas. That is not stars, not part of stars, just gas floating around in space. And it's amazing that the galaxy we live in, the Milky Way, is absolutely full of this gas. And it's just floating around, waiting to become stars. Or maybe it used to be in a star and it's been exploded out back into the galaxy. So this is the sky in this 21 centimeter wavelength radio wave that's emitted by hydrogen atoms. So the sky looks like this. There's a band of light right across it. This, imagine it's like a fisheye lens, and you're seeing the entire sky. Now, the band across the middle is the Milky Way, so the galaxy that we live in. So you can see that along the middle there. And then this gas up here is the Magellanic Clouds. These are the galaxies that live closest to our Milky Way galaxy, and they're spinning around due to the gravitational pull between our galaxy and, and those galaxies. And then there's this stream of colorful gas. 
And the colors just show you how fast the gas is moving. And this shows us that the gas is streaming between the Magellanic Clouds, these other galaxies, and our own galaxy. So that's being pulled onto our galaxy by gravity. So it's a fascinating way to study the universe in these radio waves. You learn a lot that you can't learn with regular normal light that our eyes can see. So like Galileo, we use telescopes, but our telescopes are much, much bigger than regular telescopes like the ones you look through. The one you may have at home, you may have a pair of binoculars or a, tel a tiny telescope that you'd, you'd look at the sky with. You may even have a giant telescope. You might be one of the best optical astronomers in the world. Now, but your telescope isn't as big as my telescope because this is the world's biggest radio telescope. And this is me using the world's biggest radio telescope. It's a very exciting um, opportunity to go to uh, the Caribbean, to Puerto Rico, and visit this amazing uh, dish that collects radio waves from space. This is what it looks like in the control room. Pretty old-fashioned, actually. So this radio telescope is 300 meters across. Can you imagine that? 300 meters. It was actually in a James Bond movie. I think he, um, James Bond may have bungee jumped into it or something like that. Anyway, so what this does, it's just a simple uh, collector of, of waves that happen to be coming from space down to the Earth, and they bounce off the dish and into a receiver in the middle, which turns the radio waves into electrical signals, which we can then put through computers and make into a picture of the sky in radio waves. So this telescope is much, much bigger. And the reason is because radio waves are so much longer in wavelength than optical light that the telescope that collects it has to be much, much bigger in order to make a detailed picture of the sky. Otherwise, we get really rubbishy images. So the, think about the practicalities of this for a minute. Think about how we would get better images of the sky. When, in, in any case, with any telescope, the way you get a better picture or a picture of fainter or further away objects is you build a bigger telescope. But you get into problems when you're building a telescope that's 300 meters across. How do you build a telescope even bigger? It becomes almost impractical. In fact, when you calculate what you really want to do to make really high quality crisp images of galaxies or objects in the distant universe you want to really study and understand as a scientist, you want to be able to make radio telescopes over 1,000 kilometers across. And can you imagine trying to get planning for permission for that? It wouldn't be very easy. So what we do instead of building one big telescope a 1,000 kilometers across is we join up lots of smaller telescopes. So we get lots of, uh, they're still big telescopes, they're still 20, 30, 40 meters across. But we join up lots of images from different telescopes in a huge supercomputer, and we make composite images. And in this way, we make a virtual telescope the size of the Earth. It's pretty incredible. And then the more telescopes you have, the better. Can I answer your question at the end? Is that OK? And then we can all have questions, OK? So this is what you do. You, you take pictures of the sky with lots of different radio telescopes. You join up the signals, and you make a composite picture. And this allows us to study uh, distant objects in great detail and tell objects in the sky uh, apart from one another. So I want to show you now a, a case study, uh, the sort of pictures that we can make with radio telescopes, the sort of objects that we can, that we can actually study. So I want to show you first um, something called Centaurus A, and it's a galaxy quite close to us relatively in, in the universe scale. So this is a picture of the same galaxy taken with lots of different uh, colors of light right through the electromagnetic spectrum from um, X-ray, ultraviolet, optical, that is the, the light we can see with our eyes, infrared, mid-infrared, radio, and this is the gas, H1, this is hydrogen gas. So this is exactly the same galaxy taken in different colors. And it looks very different, doesn't it? So if you look at the optical image for a second, you can see the galaxy has a lot of stars in it. It's very, very bright. And through the middle, there's this band of, of darkness, relative darkness. And that's a band of gas. And the gas um, is caused by lots of, lots of stars being formed all at once. And the gas and the dust and the, the dark matter, the dark material, um, is spewed out from these uh, stars as they die. And then that absorbs the light that's coming from the stars behind it. 
Now you'll notice the radio image looks very, very different from the others. And the X-ray image looks very, very different from the others. So you can see an extra component of the galaxy, an invisible component of the galaxy, this huge sort of like line of, of, of light in radio and this huge line of light in X-ray. And that's really mysterious, you know, when we first saw this sort of thing. In fact, this object was discovered in Parramatta um, by a Scottish astronomer who lived in Parramatta. So there you go, a bit of history. Um, so when we look with a radio telescope, what we can see is we can zoom in to the center. So we use a network of radio telescopes around the world. We can zoom into this amazing line of material in the center. And what we see in the center of this galaxy lives a huge black hole, a very, 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 very massive black hole. And this sort of line of, of material that's spewing out of it at half the speed of light. And that generates radio waves. So there's these particles spewing out from the black hole at the center of the galaxy and generating, uh, there are very strong magnetic fields, and there's a lot of hot material um, moving around these magnetic fields, and you get a lot of um, radio waves generated. So this is very, very bright. So it's amazing, isn't it, how the picture you get from an optical telescope is very different from that from a radio telescope. And what we can actually find from this um, is a, a sort of guess or a, a, an estimate of the the, the weight or the mass of the black hole at the center of the galaxy, and also an understanding of how these huge jets of material are launched um, from the, the black hole. So what we think is happening is that a lot of uh, material, gas, and broken up stars is swirling around the black hole at the center of the galaxy. And um, as material falls in, other material has to go outwards because uh, of a law called the conservation of angular momentum, and that's a physics law. Um, it's a bit like what goes up must come down, that sort of idea. If something goes in this way, moves around that way, something has to go outwards. So um, we're trying to study and understand the black hole at the center of the, the galaxy, and also um, to understand the mechanism by which these huge jets of material, just like the kind of the, the fire from the nose of a dragon are, are spewed out from the center of this galaxy. It's pretty cool stuff. So another thing we can do, we can look at other types of galaxies um, with radio telescopes. Now this is a nice example, whoopsie. This is a really nice example um, of some nearby galaxies from a survey called the H1, the Hydrogen Nearby Galaxy Survey. Things, it's a nice name. And what they did, they took a radio galaxy and they tuned it to Galaxy FM, remember that 21 centimeter uh, wavelength that allows you to look at hydrogen gas that's just floating around galaxies, not doing much. It's not part of stars. It's not part of planets. It's just floating around the place, waiting to become a star. And this, this gas in the galaxies, in fact, shows you a lot about the structure of the galaxy and, and the, the material in waiting, how you build the, the stars in the galaxy. It also allows us, um, it's, a, it's a clever trick that allows us to measure the rotation of the galaxy. And measuring the rotation of the galaxy allows us to measure the mass inside the galaxy and how that mass is distributed. So this is, this is a fantastic trick. And we use something called the Doppler effect, which is the effect where uh, if you hear an ambulance or a police car uh, screaming past you, uh, the pitch of the siren changes as it goes past you. So as something's coming towards you, the wavelength is shortened, the pitch gets higher, and as the police car goes away from you, the, the wavelength gets longer and the pitch lowers. So using that effect, but with radio waves, we can measure the change in the pitch um, and therefore the, the rotation of the galaxy. Another great thing this, this shows us, when we do this calculation, we can actually measure um, from the stars in the galaxy and the gas in the galaxy, uh, what rotation, we can predict what rotation rate there should be, just using physics from high school. And when we do that, we find that the answer we predict and the answer we actually get are very, very different. And what that calculation tells us is that the galaxy is rotating uh, much, much faster than, than it actually should seem to from the amount of material we can see within it and the laws of gravity that we understand. So either our laws of gravity are wrong, which would be a bit weird, because we've sent people to the moon and we deal with gravity every day, so that would be very, very strange. Or there's a missing component of matter in the galaxies. That is, 
Matter is just stuff, like all the atoms, all the molecules, all the things that you can touch. So there's a missing component of matter that you, you can't actually see um, with any telescope, but you can measure its gravity. And that stuff is called dark matter. So by doing measurements of hydrogen FM, um, we can actually measure that there is dark matter in the universe. And this is a great, great topic that I want to expand on a little bit more, but we can, we can, um, we can show you some more evidence of that as well. So radio telescopes are great. They can show us hidden components of the universe. They can show us what's really going on between the stars. Um, they can tune into lots of different things, neutral gas in galaxies that build up stars. We can look into the dragon-like jets of materials snorting out of the center of black holes in nearby galaxies. And there's lots more besides. Here's another piece of evidence for dark matter, by the way. Can anyone tell me what this is? Yeah, a lens, a gravitational lens. So this is, this is um, a fantastic optical image this time, not radio. And it shows a group of galaxies. So each galaxy is 100,000 million stars or so. And you can see that the galaxies are in a big cluster. You can also see the light is kind of in a, an arc or a ring. You can almost see this, this ring. And what we found throughout the years is that lots of areas of space have these, these rings or these, these streaks of light. And what they're telling us is that um, gravity, which is a f universal force that we all know about, we drop something, it falls to the Earth. This happens in space as well. Everything with matter has, has gravity associated with it. Things move towards each other. But the way Einstein described it was that gravity actually bends space and time. We'll talk a bit more about that later, but as space and time are bent, then light goes around through those little bends and causes this effect. So you can actually see light bending around a very, very massive part of this galaxy cluster. And again, if you do the same trick as we did before with the galaxies, if we add up all the stars, so each star weighs this much, how many stars are there approximately? Okay, this is how much bending of light we should see. There's nowhere near enough nowhere near enough stuff that we can see to, to cause this amount of light bending. So what we get from that is that either our gravity laws are wrong or there's this dark matter in between the galaxies that pervades this, this, this stuff that doesn't interact. It doesn't interact with other matter. It doesn't bump into things and rebound, but it has a gravitational effect. And that's the cool thing that we keep seeing in different parts of the universe. So dark matter seems to be out there. Um, and we call it dark because we don't know what it is. And it's not stars, it's not planets, it's not galaxies, it's not particles, it's not um, black holes, you know, all the, the standard things. It doesn't seem to interact with other matter. So it seems to be something else, but we don't know what. So this is one of the great questions. So the young people in the audience here at the front, maybe in your science careers, you'll be discovering the secret of what this dark matter is. And I'll be off on a beach somewhere, maybe. So, how are we going to find out this stuff? Well, we've got to build you guys, the young people, the next generation of telescopes, OK? So we can't just use the telescopes we have at the moment. They're not powerful enough to see far into the universe and to see back in time to a time when uh, the universe was very different from how it is today. So how, firstly, how can, a, how can a telescope look back in time? OK, let's think about this. So when the sun emits a particle of light or a wave of light, it takes eight minutes to get to the Earth. Even at the speed of light, that light takes eight whole minutes to get to the Earth. So then think about objects that are very, very much further away. So there are galaxies that we can see that it takes the light 10 billion years to get to us at the speed of light. So when we look at that galaxy, we're looking at how it was 10 billion years ago. So we can literally look back in time with our telescopes. It's literally time travel. We can't go there, but we can actually take a photograph of how things were billions of years ago. It's a very, very, very exciting thing to do because you're flicking back the pages of history of the universe the further and further you, you see. So astronomers around the world got together in the early 1990s and said, let's build a huge telescope all together. Let's not just 
have one country build a telescope and another country build a different telescope. Let's get together, cooperate. And this project is called the Square Kilometre Array. So the Square Kilometre Array, what does the word array mean? It means a, a group or a cluster of, of things that work together. Um, a square kilometre is an area a million square metres across. So the, the name Square Kilometre Array means a group of telescopes with a total collecting area of one million square meters or a square kilometer. So that's the, that's the name sorted out. Now this is an international organization and there are 11 member countries of the organization and these, these uh, all have the sort of full government backing at, at this time. So you can see a nice flag there, that's Australia. And the other countries from all over the world including China, and Germany, and India, and South Africa, and Great Britain, and Italy. And there are plenty of countries involved, and lots of other countries excited about the idea, but they haven't formally joined. So this idea has been growing for at least 20 years, as I, as I said at the start. So the idea is to build a huge radio telescope, one of these big networks that are connected up by a supercomputer to make pictures of the sky, not only um, of objects in the nearby universe, but objects very, very far away. So these are the, the member countries. Um, it actually covers quite a good geographical spread. We want to get some South, South Americans involved. We've got a lot of countries in Africa interested in, in hosting telescopes there, uh, and Canada there, and a lot of European countries, and of course this, this Asian group as well. So it's a really good project because governments like international projects. This is a high-tech project. It's very complex. There's not just telescopes to build, there's electronics to build, there's supercomputers to build. So it's a, it's a great way to get the, brains of, the best brains of different countries together to design something really, really special. So this is what the component in Australia will look like. So this is one section of the telescope. And this is going to be um, initially made up of about 125,000 basically TV aerials, if I can describe it in a crude sense. They're very, very high tech, but essentially the front end of it is a TV aerial, these metal Christmas tree shapes. And these are all pointed up at the sky. And you've got 10, 000, uh, 125,000 of them, and they're all spread out over a number of kilometers in Western Australia. And they're all studying the sky. And the signals are all joined together in a supercomputer made into to images of the sky. And in, in Africa, what we're going to do is build about 200 dishes initially. And these, these are, the project's going to be built in two stages. So this is stage one. Um, and about 250 dishes. And they'll all work together collecting radio waves uh, and making very sensitive images of the sky as well. Now in phase two of the project, um, these sort of Christmas trees are going to expand to about a million. So can you imagine even doing that practically, deploying a million of these amazing antennas out in, in the West Australian desert. And then the dish array in Africa is going to grow to about 2,000 or 2,500 uh, dishes in phase two. So in about a decade's time, we'll have this huge, huge new telescope, um, which will be able to probe some of the real mysteries of the universe that we don't understand. So what I want to talk a little bit about now is these mysteries of the universe. What are the key science projects that astronomers and scientists, uh, cosmologists want to look at with, the, with this telescope? In fact, there's a very detailed science case uh, written by scientists who got together, got their heads together and wrote a thousand pages or so of ideas. Um, and this is being condensed down into just a few key science projects. So one of these science projects is to measure galaxy evolution. And remember what I said about the sun being eight light minutes away. So we're seeing it as it was eight minutes ago. And we look more and more distant objects and we see them as they were millions or billions of years ago. So what we want to do is do a huge cosmic census. So to get a, a survey that looks at the entire sky and looks as far as we possibly can with a telescope and look at literally hundreds of millions or even up to a billion galaxies and measure what they look like. Are they the funny dragon ones? Are they the spirally ones? Are they merging? How massive are they? Do they have black holes in the centers? Do they have dark matter? Are they spinning faster than we thought they should? And look at that throughout the history of the universe and do this amazing 
kind of study an encyclopedia of the universe through galaxies. And we also want to uh, search for, I might start the slide again to explain why I have this movie. Search for the structure in the, gal in the universe. So we know that gravity pulls things together. That's why we have a solar system made up of planets, which are little lumps of matter, and the star in the middle, which is the sun. And also galaxies are, are big lumps of matter that conglomerate together. And then also, each one of these points in this little movie is a galaxy, and you've got hundreds of millions of galaxies all clustered into groups because gravity is pulling them together, and we think dark matter is um, sort of invisibly pulling them together as well. And we want to understand how galaxies cluster and clump and form into this wonderful cosmic web. looks like a sort of a spider's web. So we have bits of space that are full of galaxies and bits of space that have almost no galaxies. So we want to understand that. The next science goal is something that I study, which is um, magnetic fields. Now, who here hasn't, oh, everyone must have got a magnet, put a piece of paper over it and sprinkled iron filings on it at some point. That's a rite of passage, right? Okay, so the magnetic field is something that's invisible. It's very long range. Um, it's quite weak in, in, the t in terms of um, cosmic forces. It's not as strong as the, the forces that keep an atom together, for example. But it, it goes right through the universe. Magnetic fields exist on Earth in magnets, bar magnets. A magnetic field exists in the Earth itself because you can use a compass to find north and south. That's because the Earth is a big magnet. And the, the Earth is a magnet because it has a core of iron inside it and it's spinning around. And when you move, um, you move an electrically charged um, region, you actually generate a magnetic field. And then, not just is the Earth uh, a magnet, but the sun is a magnet. And you see that uh, in the sunspots and the, the amazing flares from the surface of the sun. And then our galaxy, it turns out, is a magnet. So when I turn my radio telescope at the sky, um, I can actually see magnetic fields in regions where stars are forming, and I can see them in regions where stars are exploding. And they're actually shaping a lot of things in our galaxy. And they're pretty strong, and we f even find them now between galaxies. So the universe is full of these invisible magnetic fields. So we want to understand more about how the force of magnetism um, is actually interacting with material and shaping the universe. And that's a, that's a pretty nice, it's a pretty nice new area of science. This one, now, I told you earlier um, how gravity actually bends space and time. And this science project wants to test Einstein's theories of how space and time are bent by massive objects, that is like stars and black holes and that sort of thing. So what they want to do is look at these stars called pulsars. And pulsars are very compact stars, and they're like lighthouses. So they have two bright beams of radio light shooting out of them. And every time they spin around once, or half time, actually, we can see this beam of light with our radio telescopes. It's a beam of radio waves. And now, if a pulsar is orbiting around another very massive object, like a black hole or another star, another compact star, we think that it causes these gravitational waves. So these ripples, a bit like when a boat goes through the harbor, you get the wash. It's pretty much the same as that. So we think that when two very massive objects come close to one another, you get this big disturbance, a bit of a wash coming out into space time. And we want to measure that by measuring how the stars bob up and down on that wash or in the swell. So that's a really, really um, exciting piece of science. People think people are chasing the Nobel Prize in this, in this area. This is to find gravitational waves. Um, and this is something that uh, Australian astronomers are already trying to do with the Parkes radio telescope. And with the square kilometer array, we're more likely to find uh, uh, tens of thousands of more pulsars of these amazing lighthouse stars. So we'll be able to see uh, lots of examples where the pulsars are orbiting around compact objects, maybe black holes, and to really test strongly the Einstein's theory about this amazing gravitational wash. Now remember the Christmas tree 
uh, array in Australia that, that's going to be built. This one's really interesting because the dishes work at higher frequencies and they can see a lot of things like gas and galaxies and uh, some individual stars like pulsars. Now the Christmas trees are, are going to be look, looking back at the very early areas of the universe, so just after the Big Bang. Now in the early, just like in the early morning, sometimes you go out into the country and um, it'll be a bit foggy. You'll kind of see the, you know, the fog just drifting up above the river or something. It's a beautiful misty morning. And then what happens is the sun rises a little bit higher. And around, sometimes around half past eight, nine o'clock, the sun breaks through that fog or mist and it, it bursts through and then the mist disappears quickly. So at the start of the universe, something like that happened. A lot of the universe was just flat and boring. It was all misty, just full of hydrogen gas. And that's around this time. And then gravity took over and gas started to pull together into clumps and form stars and galaxies. And then when that happened, the mist was kind of illuminated by the sunlight caused by these stars, these new, new stars and new galaxies. And that's this part. So these stars and galaxies are, are piercing light into this mist and breaking up the mist. And then as we come, this is called the cosmic dawn. And then as we come out and out in time from the Big Bang, these bubbles get bigger and bigger. And there are more and more stars and galaxies forming. And there's more light, ultraviolet light, optical light, infrared radiation. And, and all of that is breaking up the mist. And we want to study this time. And by looking at radio waves, we can actually study this time. We can study the early cosmic mist. And we can study how it was broken up by the early stars and galaxies. So really, we're seeing a piece of the universe, a time in the universe, is history that we've never, ever been able to see before. So this will be a genuinely unique piece of the universe's history that we'll be able to study with the amazing array of um, up to a million uh, TV aerials, basically, these Christmas tree dipoles in Australian desert. This is one of my favorite science projects for the SKA, now the cradle of life. So it's composed of a couple of different things, but it's essentially answering the question, where do, you, where do we come from? Where does life come from? Is there other life in the universe? Are we alone? Now, um, the first part of this is looking for signs of technological civilizations around other stars. So this stuff isn't wacky. You know that we are using electronic equipment here in, the, in, in this room. We're using cameras and, and um, we're using laptops and things, and all those things emit radio waves. So we're emitting radio waves. And we also use TV. So we've got you know, the big thing in Chatswood, that big TV antenna that's broadcasting a lot of radio waves. And then we use things like airport radars, and they're very, very strong radars that, that broadcast radio waves up into the sky. And then we use... Um, uh, even more powerful radars occasionally to study the upper areas of our atmosphere um, using things like the Arecibo radio telescope. And sometimes we broadcast very, very strong signals in radio. So if you, you were outside the Earth, an alien looking down with a telescope, you'd actually be, be able to see the Earth as quite a bright, bright radio object if you tuned into the right frequencies. You'd actually be able to watch Home and Away or whatever was broadcasting at the time. So if we actually use this square kilometer array to look at the nearby planets around us, not just the planets in our solar system, but around other stars, we should be able to see if there are any technological civilizations around the nearest 100,000 stars or so. So if there's just people hanging out using communication like we do, not just broadcasting deliberately to us, but just doing their thing, you know, looking, having airports and having communications from radio, we should be able to actually see that with the square kilometer array. So that's an exciting prospect in itself. The other exciting things we can do with radio telescopes is to tune in, not to hydrogen this time, but into other frequencies that show us where certain molecules are, like water. And I study water in the universe. And we can also tune into other frequencies like um, other molecules, like uh, amino acids, so complex molecules. And we think these molecules are the building blocks of life. So if we can tune into the radio frequencies that are emitted naturally by these molecules in space, we'll be able to see if there are building blocks of life hanging out where stars are forming, planets are forming, 
and then we can think, okay, there might be life in the universe, there might be a reason why life can, can happen in certain solar systems and not others. And a very, very cool thing that we can start to do even now with our radio telescopes is to look for planetary systems forming. So this image I'm showing you now, this is an artist's impression in blue, but this in orange is real. This is a disk, a solar system disk forming around another star. This is a picture taken with the Atacama um, millimeter telescope. Now this is amazing. So in the middle is another star. So it's taken in millimeter wave radio waves. There's a star forming in the middle. And then you can see this, it's like the rings of Saturn. You see a disk of material. So this is molecules and gas and things like that. Gravity is pulling it into planets. So you can see there's about how many rings? About one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight ish. Ooh, eight. That sounds familiar. Um, if, you're, if you're older than about 20, you'll probably think nine. But we've got nine planets, and now we've got eight planets. But there are lots and lots of planets out there. Um, they're just not all called planets anymore. So this solar system, just like ours, is forming. And this is a real picture taken in radio waves. Um, only last year, I think. So even now, we're starting to see inside large groups of gas in our galaxy where stars are being born, we can see planets being born. This is amazing. And with the square kilometer array, we'll be able to do this around thousands and thousands of other stars and really get a feel for if our solar system's normal. Do all solar systems have rocky planets towards the center and then these gas giant planets like Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune towards the edge? Is it often the other case? Um, are solar systems stable and long-lived, or do they sometimes just destroy themselves? Do they often have lots and lots of large planets, lots of small planets? Can we find life signs in any of these regions? So all that stuff is, is really transformational, and I, I can't wait to see, to see how we go with that science. So now I want to talk a little bit about how we actually build this thing. And the great thing is, the great thing about my job is I've been fortunate to be involved in the Australian SKA Pathfinder project. So I'm the project scientist for that. And CSIRO runs this project, and we've built uh, a big radio telescope array made up of 36 dishes. And these dishes are each about three stories high. Um, they're 12 meters across, and they're very, very smart. They have a lot of electronics, and brand new cameras have been designed by CSIRO in Sydney. So this is a local thing, this is an exciting thing, this is a new thing, and something that I can tell you about now. So how do we actually meet the challenges of building 2,500 dishes in South Africa and a million of these Christmas tree dipoles? Well, we practice with it on a smaller scale, and that's what we've done. So what we've done with, with the international SKA project has found two sites. I mentioned the, the Southern Africa and the Western Australia sites. So here they are. And the common thing about these sites is they're very remote. There aren't many people living nearby. There are some people living nearby in both places. But they're quite uh, low population density areas. So this is the Karoo region of South Africa. And this is the Murchison region of Western Australia. So the reason that you don't build an optical telescope in a city is because of light pollution, right? You can't see the sky, it's not dark. Same thing with radio waves. If you build a radio telescope near a city, you know, the, the, the TV tower will drown you out. You won't be able to see anything. So you need to build radio telescopes in remote areas. So this is the Murchison Radio Astronomy Observatory in uh, WA. So CSIRO has, has, um, CSIRO has uh, built this radio observatory up and we've built up a um, radio quiet zone um, in the Shire of Murchison. The Shire of Murchison already has a population density of uh, two nano people per square meter or something. Uh, it's actually 120 people um, live in the Shire of Murchison, and it's bigger than Holland, the Shire of Murchison, so it's very, very low po population density. And we've got a legal, legally protected radio quiet zone. So, um, the emissions from other, from other activities in the region are, are um, controlled by agreements, um, which keeps it a really, really radio quiet area for us to do astronomy, which is great. And as I said, we've practiced. We've built smaller arrays of telescopes, both the dishes 
here. This is our project ASCAP, the Australian SK Pathfinder. And this is the Murchison Wide Field Array, which is a version of the Christmas tree type telescope. We have little dipoles on the ground, and these are radio telescopes that don't move. They just intercept the radio waves, turn them into electri electrical signals, and then into pictures. So both telescopes do the same job. They make pictures of the sky, but they use different technologies, and we're trying to work out what the best technologies are. When you want to build a telescope, you've got to build relationships. Um, and the Wadri Yamaji people are traditional owners of the site in the Murchison region. And we've built up really good relationships, and that's actually a vital part of the project. Um, so one of the things I've been involved in is um, the, the local school the community has. Uh, it's a remote community with about 20 houses or so. But it's actually got a school. Um, it's a very good school. So we go out to the school, and we do, we've do. Um, we got a telescope there, and we do night viewings and day viewings of the moon. Um, we also do some mentoring and some astronomy lessons and things like that. And the kids have had lots of fun um, making black holes out of black sheets of uh, um, the black bed sheets and things, guessing the weights of planets, um, learning, uh, combining local language with um, astronomy, and also um, visiting the site as well, which has been really good. So um, that's been a really rewarding relationship um, out in the Murchison. And we're lucky to have the support of the local people. So. The third thing you do when you build a telescope is you actually build the telescope. So that's the stage we've got to. It's, it's a long process, um, but we've, we've got really far. So this is how you actually build 36 dishes. This is a little bit sped up, but in fact, we can get one of these things up in about a day now, which is not too bad. But if you're going to do 2,500, you're going to have to speed that up a little bit. Um, so this is uh, how you actually put a three-story high telescope up. Um, and it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty amazing how efficiently and how quickly it was done. Um, but there are lots more components to the telescope. So what I'm showing here is just the dish. It's made of, um, we actually did fill those bits in. Um, <laughs> we actually um, uh, make it out of uh, steel or aluminium. It depends you know, what you, whether you want strength or for bigger telescopes or, or lightweight properties with aluminium. And then you paint it. And so the radio waves come in and they reflect off the surface of the dish and they all reflect because of the shape of the dish into the center here. So this is the camera. So at the center of the telescope, you build a, a radio camera or a receiver. So this is a close-up picture of the radio camera that we've built. So CSIRO have, have designed and built a completely new technology. This is um, essentially a camera that has uh, almost 200 of these pixels. So it's a bit like a fly's eye. You can see lots of directions at once. So you know you can never catch a fly because it can see wherever, you, wherever your arms are. Um, so this camera is a little bit like that. And um, it's much, much uh, broader field of view. Helps you to study the universe more quickly, more efficiently than traditional radio telescopes. So what we've also had to do is dig about 7,000 kilometers of optical fiber. So when the uh, radio waves are collected in the dish, they go into the camera, they're turned into electrical signals. They go th uh, through optical fibers um, you know, with lasers, uh, and then they go through uh, the site from all the different telescopes, each one of the telescopes here. There's 36 of them into a central building here. And this is the control building. Now in here lives a giant brain, which is a computer, a giant supercomputer, if you will. And the, the building is, is quite low to the ground, and it's very, very shielded. We have these airlock doors, very, very thick steel doors, so we don't let any radio emissions from the computers out into the telescopes. Otherwise, there'd be no point being in a remote area if we just you know, blew out loads of radio waves. And um, there are um, optical fibers, as I said, coming from each telescope. And the data is streaming at about 72 terabits per second, so 72 trillion bits of information per second from the telescope into this computer. And the computer combines and multiplies the signals together from the, uh, from the telescopes. And that enables astronomers to extract the physical information. It's not just like taking a photo. You don't just you know, do a selfie with the night sky or something. Um, you've got to actually do a lot of work to extract radio images. So that's quite tricky. Now, the telescope's uh, signal's journey doesn't end there on the site. The Murchison Radio Astronomy Observatory 
um, has this uh, facility that I just showed you. Now the, the signals go through the National Broadband Network to Geraldton, which is 350 kilometers from the site. That's still a hefty four-hour drive along dirt tracks, um, away from mobile phones, which is good. And, um, and then the signals <laughs> go through uh, from Geraldton to Perth, which is another, I don't know, 600 kilometers or something. And in Perth, we have a high-performance computing facility um, called the Pawsey Center. Uh, and this is where all the magic happens and the science pops out the other end. So it's a lot of work to get, to get radio telescope signals into a, into a picture. Now, the astronomers, you might notice I'm standing here in Sydney. I'm not out in the Murchison. Uh, I've been there many times, but in fact, that's the idea. We don't want astronomers to go there because then it's not a remote location if you keep shipping people out there. So again, we want to keep the, the radio telescopes untouched and have scientists in Sydney uh, or in Perth. We have an office in Perth now as well. And we ship a lot of the data across through, again, the um, optical fiber networks, uh, the internet networks, um, into Sydney, into our offices. And then this is, of course, me sitting posing for a photographer. This is what people think I do, and this is what I actually do. It's what I actually look at. So it's uh, a lot of data crunching, uh, a lot of programming skills and things like that to actually get from the raw data into something usable. But in the end, we make beautiful pictures. And this is a real picture from uh, the Australian SKA Pathfinder, even just six telescopes of it, so 36 in total. We're currently commissioning the instrument with six telescopes to, again, build up from small and then learn to walk and then learn to run and then build the world's biggest telescope. That's the plan. So this is a typical radio picture of the sky. So if you just take um, one snapshot of the sky for a, a number of hours through the night, this is what you get. And what you can see is just loads and loads. This is a deliberately um, non-gassy piece of the sky. Um, so a lot of the things you see are point-like sources, and these are very, very distant galaxies. Very, very, very distant galaxies, like the one you saw earlier with the, the, the dragon jets spewing out of them. And at the center of each of these galaxies will be a supermassive black hole. It's fantastic. What we can also look at is nearby galaxies, so they look much more shapely, if you will. So this is a radio image of a piece of the sky made recently um, by one of my colleagues. And you can see some of these galaxies aren't point-like sources. They're actually, they're actually bigger. You can see the shapes and sizes of them. So we've got optical images of each galaxy here. There's 10 of them next to a radio picture. And what the colors show you, they're all like little rainbows. That shows you the Doppler effect. Again, you can see the rotation, the movement of gas in the galaxy. And again, you can find out how big and how much the galaxy weighs, and therefore discern what's at its center, how much mass it has, how much dark matter it has. So it's a very interesting way uh, to do astronomy, to use radio telescopes. The next amazing thing we've, we've done with this little test array is to um, look at parts of the galaxy like this. So this is an old image from another telescope. And we're, because we're commissioning the telescope, we want to ch essentially check that it works. So we get an old picture from an existing telescope, and we make uh, new pictures, so old, new, old, new. So we compare the pictures um, with the old telescope to, a, to our telescope, and these are amazing things like supernova remnants in our galaxy. This is a region of star formation in our galaxy. And this is a pulsar. And we can make pictures of all these things in one snapshot because of our new cameras. So we're, we're really, really pushing the boundaries uh, of radio astronomy here in Sydney, which is great. That makes you proud of the CSIRO? Oh, thanks. So what's next? So we're building these amazing pathfinders. We're, we're working them. We're, we're showing the technology works. Where it doesn't work, we're fixing it. We're changing it. We're modifying it. We're finding out how to build the world's biggest telescope. And this is a long process. It's been going on for several years. We're really getting to the results phase now. We've actually got one scientific paper uh, submitted and about to be accepted by the Royal Astronomical Society's journal, um, which is a discovery of uh, hydrogen gas um, about 7.7 billion light years away in a very distant galaxy. Um, we've got another paper about to be submitted on nearby galaxies and their rotation rates, and another paper on the pulsars I showed you there. So, you know, we're starting to do real science and make real discoveries with this telescope in Western Australia, which is just the most recent of the telescopes that we've built and operated here in Australia that includes the Parkes Radio Telescope 
uh, the Australia Telescope Compact Array near Narrabri in New South Wales, and uh, the Mopra Radio Telescope, and a, an array of telescopes covering the whole country. So next is to build the SKA, and what's happening internationally is people are designing it right now. So a lot of these people aren't astronomers, they're you know, real people who actually make things, like engineers, useful people who design things, and uh, tel uh, software engineers, people designing systems to transport huge, vast amounts of data. 10 to 100 times the global internet traffic will have to be uh, streamed off this telescope when it's up and running. It's an absolutely massive, massive challenge technologically to design and build this telescope. So what's happening? People are designing different receivers. People are designing software uh, systems. They're designing the actual the, the antennas. They're designing the dishes. That's being led by uh, Sydney. And you know all the different things. Infrastructure, which just means all the holes in the ground and all the buildings and all the important things that you need to build an observatory. So all this is being done right now across the world in about 20 countries. So it's a vast operation. And uh, it's, it's an incredibly exciting time for the project. So this is just a recap of what the Square Kilometre Array will look like and when. So a bit of a timeline. So in phase one of the project, which will cost about 650 million euros, um, some of the funding has actually been promised by governments. A couple of governments have signed up and said, you know, we're going to commit this amount of money. And the other negotiations are happening right now with, with different governments around the world to, to put that money on the table for the construction. This phase one will be 125,000 Christmas trees, 200 dishes, those will be in Australia. And the completion date is estimated at 2020. So that's about right for you people, right? You'll be just starting to ramp up your careers, so that's good. Yeah. Yeah. So phase two, we're thinking about 2024-ish, into the next decade. We're looking at a million of those Christmas tree dipoles, so really starting to look right back to the very earliest phase of the universe. The cosmic fog is clearing, the first black holes and galaxies are forming. And we're starting to understand how the first structures in the universe were formed. And we suspect that they're very, very different from the ones we see today. So this is going to be an incredibly transformational period of science uh, around the next decade. And all that is happening in Australia, in Southern Africa, and with partners around the world. So I don't think you can get much more exciting than that. Um, I'm going to leave you with a little movie. And this is a movie of my favorite telescope in the world, the Australian SKA Pathfinder, my baby. And um, I just thank you very much for, for listening. Thank you. <laughs>